Okay, thank you. So we are going to continue with our chapter seven. We finished up. So chapter seven is all about rejecting liberalism. Be good to understand what that is. Concepts of freedom related to that. We finished up with communism, looking at how that took place and the role it played in Russia. Okay, now we're gonna look at fascism particularly looking at the Nazi Germans. Okay. Uh, do any more of you need the notes? Like some of you have an empty desk in front of you. We need that. There's notes over here, please come grab them. Okay. There's either the fill in the blank, which I think would be preferable, or the, I can just stand in front of the camera so you don't get caught into it. Right now? Yeah, I'm recording. Why is that the front of camera? Because people were walking back. Okay, so. Come on, man. Come on. You're supposed to be the third person. So, fascism. Briefly, this is how the textbook looks at it. There's political, economic, and social ideas. Funny enough, you know, there's a lot of. Uh, a lot of people won't say that the communist people were fascists as well, but you'll see many similarities, So, partic particularly on the political side of things. Cult of the leader and elite rule. Right, so a lot of fascist political strategy, they create a cult. Okay. So in China, they did the same thing, despite the fact that they're communists. People had to go somewhere to get a photo of uh, Mao Zedong and put that in their house. Okay. Uh, and I want to say Hitler did the same thing. Extreme nationalism. Nationalism, you should have learned a lot about that in grade 11. But this extreme desire towards the benefit of their own country. Again, many communists, many fascist states did the same thing. Organized violence and war and military force. Again, something utilized by both the Nazis and the communists. It is in the country's national interest to expand its territory. Again, as we learned in that Russian Revolution documentary, many of these communists were also looking at ways to expand their ideological system into the rest of the world. Okay, so it may not have necessarily been a military takeover, but it's a takeover of some kind. And the Nazis did that as well. Economically speaking, fascism has a government-directed private enterprise economy to serve the needs and interests of the state. Uh, and I would love to do more research on that specifically, but obviously government-directed economy serving the needs and interests of the people of the state is very much communism as well. Okay. Anti-union, anti-workers is rights. We'll look more into that when we start talking about Nazism specifically. Social ideas, inequalities between individuals and groups of people. So in communism, rather than having an enemy group, let's say an ethnic group, you have class, different class in society. So you have rich versus poor. And obviously in more modern understandings, I don't know if you kids have ever heard of the phrase intersectionalism, intersectionality, uh, basically kind of Marxist ideas wrapped up into a bundle. And so intersectionalism would essentially look at all of the ways you intersect so I'm not gonna say your name but I'm gonna use you as an example interestingly enough because you said so your, your dad is indigenous yeah right your mom is white and you're a male right so these different ways you intersect so within this idea of inequality between individuals and groups it's like you know are you part of the oppressed class of people by having an indigenous father or are you part of the oppressor class of people by having a white mother, right? And then if you're a male versus a female, how else does that play a role, right? So fascists essentially would say they'd potentially pick a particular group of people. So in this class, let's say we could blame, put all the blame on, I don't know, who should we put the blame on? All right, never mind, don't answer that question, okay? <laughs> okay, racial purity is something that was more specific to what Hitler was doing, although I think that was kind of a one-off. I don't think a lot of other fascist states did that. 
racial or national superiority. You know, that's just very extreme nationalism. And, you know, to an extent, the communists had that superiority as well, a superior system that, that they believed, despite the fact that they created hell. National strength, more important than individual rights. Okay, so we'll look into this. And of course, my remote is touching something else. So. So this is a little chart, uh, just a political map, and compass. Uh, and fascism is towards the bottom with maximum political control by government. It varies though between communism having more government control of the economy and fascism is maximum economic freedom for individuals. Although I would say that this chart is somewhat flawed, but we don't need to get into that. Yeah, it's not much anyway. What's that? It's not much anyway. Oh. Okay, so fascism originates in Italy from a guy named Benito Mussolini. He was an Italian dictator. He is using this term to have a uh, so fascism comes from the Italian word fascio and the Latin word fascis, I believe I'm saying those right, meaning sticks bundled around an ax. So it's an ancient Roman symbol for power and authority. Okay, but they're essentially binding together certain aspects of their society to create a more powerful unified state. And it's rejecting liberalism in a couple ways. So obviously it's rejecting democracy. So Benito Mussolini was not voted into power. Hitler had a quasi-legal process of gaining power, but obviously he used a lot of force, intimidation, and, uh, and you know he also murdered a lot of people in, in the process of gaining power over Germany. So they're rejecting this idea of democracy. They're rejecting rejecting the idea of individual rights and freedoms. By part, let's say particularly by removing those rights and freedoms for certain groups of people that they target. And to some extent, and I think this was more Mussolini, they reject capitalism as well. Although I'm not 100% sure about that. So it rejects communist ideas such as, or let's say collectivist ideas such as egalitarianism and empowerment to the working class. So with fascism, you really are nation and state oriented. You, you are there to benefit the country and nation at large. You will live for it, you will serve it, you will die for it if necessary. It's not so much about your individual desires. So fascism plays, starts to gain some traction after World War II. Sorry, at the end of World War I, correction. Okay. And a lot of extreme political ideas start to gain traction at the end of World War I. Particularly because you know people saw this horrendous conflict play out in front of them. Many people probably lost their faith in humanity. Additionally, you have the Great Depression, which negatively impacted the entire world. It obviously impacted some countries worse than others, as we'll look into when we get to Germany. But some people thought that liberalism played a big role in the cause of World War I. Although, you know, if you look at it now, I mean, to some extent, you can understand that it was... Actually, I won't comment on that. I haven't thought about it enough recently. Okay, that second point there. So fascists, they portrayed democratic governments as weak, unstable, and unable to respond to the economic, social, and political problems faced by countries. So you can already see that the stem of these two ideas of fascism and communism come from a very similar place. That rather than allowing the will of the people, you know, democratically speaking, to guide where the country goes, instead a group of people should take power, take control, and guide that country themselves. Okay. 
So rather than allowing individuals to be free, instead you want to control them and have some sort of, um, let's say, unnatural manipulation of society, of the economy, and of how decisions are made. And that ultimately comes back down to the question of who should be responsible for making choices in your life. Should it be me? Should it be one of your other teachers? Should it be the administrators, your parents, you? At what point should you become responsible for your own life and make your own decisions? Some of the key beliefs, so again, society has a shared purpose. This is also very true of communism as well. Under Nazi Germany, the shared purpose was to rebuild their country and then to create living space and leave <coughs> Trump for the Aryan race. For the communists, their society had the shared purpose of bringing this utopian bringing utopia forth for people to enjoy. Us versus them. So Germany obviously wanted to dominate as much as it possibly could. Us versus them in terms of communism might be more so the people who support it and the people who are against it. But again, if you think that you have the moral high ground and you're creating utopia, you're gonna have a lot of enemies who are preventing you from creating that, let's say, heaven on earth. Uh, more specific to fascism, you have high awareness of ethnic and cultural group distinctions. So obviously Germans and Jews during Nazi Germany and lead up to World War II and World War II. Another high awareness of ethnic and cultural group distinctions. You could think of the Israel and Palestine situation right now. You know, they're very aware of each other's ethnic status, let's say. Lastly, national goals can be achieved through discipline, obedience, and the creation of an all-powerful state. Again, this is very similar to communism. They're trying to create a particular narrative and a story for society to move forward. And this rejects liberalism because rather than you being allowed to live your own life with the stories you have and the goals you have, instead, you have to submit to the goals and the story that your government tells you. Which begs a good question, like what, what is the story of your own life? When you die, what would you like people to tell about your life and who you were? I think Joseph, I think it was Joseph Campbell who said this. He said that most people live a myth, they just don't know which one. And many people live a tragedy. And part of that is having self-awareness, which is necessary for liberalism, for freedom. You have to be self-aware of who you are, what you're doing, and why you're doing that. But these, these, these non-liberal political systems hijack that from you. Instead, they say, well, we'll tell you who you are and who you're going to be and what you're going to do. And maybe even why you're going to do it. They can convince you at a young enough age. So part of this process in Germany, because we're shifting into that now, you know, particularly us versus them mentality comes from, in Germany's case, social Darwinism. Also, I don't know whose earphones are playing very loudly. Okay, you want to tell them to lower their volume? Yeah, I don't know if it's you or Meshach. Someone's stuff is playing loudly. Okay, whoever it is, just lower it, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, okay. So, you have social Darwinism, which played a role in Germany's understanding, or Nazi Germany's understanding of us versus them. It's more or less based on Charles Darwin's book, The Origin of Species, but they are, and you know, I've learned since the ideas of Charles Darwin are usually understood incorrectly, and the Nazis understood them incorrectly as well, but they were functioning off this idea of survival of the fittest. Let 
let me think for a moment. Because I, if I understand correctly, Charles Darwin was essentially saying that fitness relates to a species' capacity to essentially adapt to problems. So the species that survives is the one that adapts the quickest to problems. Right? So you could think about that in terms of sports. You know, if your opposing team is doing something that's working very well and you don't make an adjustment or adapt to that strategy and try to prevent it, you're going to lose the game. Similarly, you know, animals co-develop this as well. So some animals, like let's say deer, gazelle, like they're very quick. So the predators have to also be fast. Or the predators learn how to blend in properly with their fur and so they can be sneaky. Right, so the animals that adapt the quickest to problems are the ones that survive and pass on their genetics because they're alive to do it. You know, the Nazis then took that survival of the fittest and said that, well, there must be particular groups and ethnic groups within huma humanity who have better genetics than others and are more suited to let's say, spreading their genetics and to staying alive. Okay. And for the Nazis, they played a role, and not just the Nazis, because you know eugenics was practiced in Canada. We'll look at eugenics shortly. There was this idea that, well, as people, we should play a role in that survival of the fittest in our species and make sure that the people who we think are unsuitable for having children don't have children, which is a very horrible idea to play with. Okay, so eugenics is an ideology based on the improvement of the human species through selective breeding or typically genocide. Okay, so how many of you own a dog? Okay, well, what breed of dog do you have? Uh, German Shepherd. German Shepherd, great example. So if you look at a picture of a German Shepherd from 100 years ago, now they look very different, particularly the physical structure. Right, what kind of dog do you have? Bulldog. Bulldog, excellent example, two for two. You have one with a shortened up face? Yeah. So your dog probably struggles to breathe, right? And it walks sometimes funny. And it walks funny, right? That's because of selective breeding for particular traits, and then inbreeding as well. You know, like. I really don't know if people should own bulldogs, man. <laughs> it's not good. What kind of dog do you have? Yeah. Uh, a shepherd. Okay, I, I don't know anything about those dogs. Uh, how about a blue dealer? Do you have a dog? What's up? Do you have a dog? I do, I do not have a dog. Uh, hey, Mr. Kawaja, do you watch Bluey? I don't even know what that is. Anyways, the reason why I bring it up is that humans, you know, we're very comfortable. Let's say, like, you want to get a dog. You want to get a pur purebred, and we're totally okay with that. But historically, at some point in history, people thought, well, we should have purebred humans. Right? Hitler, suggest <laughs> Hitler suggested, you know, we should have this Aryan race. And we should have other ethnic groups that shouldn't exist. Okay, in Canada, they genocided and eugenic you genocize indigenous people. You know, like if you look at some of the stories, many of these individuals had their reproductive capacity stolen from them while they were sleeping. Essentially, you know, many people were taken, they're put into forced procedures, and then you know, years later were wondering, like, oh, why am I not able to have a child? They go to a doctor, and the doctor, for many women, told them, like, hey, you know, you're missing certain parts in your body that allow you to have a child. And I remember watching this one particular documentary where the woman was she was explaining, like, she was dumbfounded. She said, what are you talking about? Like, yeah, you're literally missing potential. I think it was her ovaries. I don't know exactly which part. Like, you're missing this thing. Said, well, how can that be? Like, well, it looks like someone surgically removed it, right? And so in Canada, we have a history of eugenics as well. We actually practice it for quite a bit. Like, like after World War II, to some extent, Canada was still practicing eugenics after the world had clearly decided, you know what, what the Nazis was doing was really messed up. 
we fought and died and bled overseas to defeat the Nazis and then for the next 10 to 15 years after we just didn't bother to really deal with the Nazis at home you know like I'm doing that metaphor I think the camera can see me here right so again this idea that some people should have children versus other people not and some of the people sometimes it was ethnic groups sometimes it was based on mental or physical capacity right like uh, people with disabilities in in Germany you know, were not allowed to have children and maybe you know put to death to some extent which is a fundamental rejection of the right to life which comes with liberalism and the equality of citizens to some extent you're all equal to some extent. You have an equal right to life. So that gives you a bit of an ideological precursor to, I should actually switch these slides around, that should be later. Um, anyways, looking into some of the more political and sorry not political looking into some of the other events that took place which led not which led Germany to its to becoming more and more extreme at the end of World War one Germany is broke just to quickly recap Germany assists Austria Hungary in its conflict with Serbia other parts of the world. At the end of the war, despite the fact that Germany didn't start the war, Germany is blamed entirely for World War I, and they are demanded, they're told that they must pay reparations. And part of that was, you know, France wanted Germany to suffer. I think that that's been very clearly proven, and many people have that opinion. The payment and the Treaty of Versailles was not set up necessarily to avoid a second war or avoid conflict. It was, you know, it seems it was almost set up just to punish Germany. Why punish Germany? I'm not entirely sure. You know, they didn't start the war, but they did very well in the war. And many Germans at the time felt that it was ridiculous to sign the Treaty of Versailles. So one thing you should understand about World War I was, was, was that it was a war of attrition, meaning there was no clear winner or loser at the end of World War I. They basically were just running out of soldiers and food and supplies. They had just killed everyone, used all their resources, and people were just tired and fed up. Like That's how World War I came to an end, more or less. There was no clear winner. Obviously, Germany got the short end of the stick. The Great Depression is the final straw in this downward spiral for Germany. And so while from about 1919 to 1929, America is able to help out financially and to at least give Germany a bit of a leg for them to stand on while they try to pay off these debts. During the Great Depression, America has to stop doing that you know, because they're also suffering but that takes Germany from a bad situation into a horrible situation. So Germany is also in a political crisis and I think I'll just save that discussion for the later slides. Here's a little quote here. So I believe this is the Treaty of Versailles. It says that Germany must pay the equivalent of 20 billion gold marks, approximately US 4.5 billion at the time, in reparations to allied governments between 1919 and 1921, and an additional 80 billion gold marks with interest after this time. Okay, so they're paying about 100 billion gold marks, their currency. And this would essentially, in today's prices, this would be $121 billion in two years, and $485.5 billion afterwards. Okay. Just to give you an idea, in 2016, Germany had, had, 
Germany had a trade surplus of $310 billion, the highest in the world. Okay, so in, so in a few short years, they're asking Germany to pay an absurd amount of money back to the countries that they fought. So essentially why I have that included in there is that they've backed Germany into a corner from which they can't escape. And they can't exactly move forward in, let's say, a peaceful manner. You know, they're just stuck between a rock and a hard place, financially speaking. So look at that chart on the top right side. And that shows you how the German economy crumbled. If we look at the top, it says December 1918, one US dollar equals 8.25 German marks, which obviously isn't great, but it's not terrible. In four years, not that long, one US dollar, so December 19, 2022, one US dollar equals 7,590 German marks. So the German money is now just useless. Yeah, absolutely. And by December of 1923, one US dollar is equal to 4 trillion 200 billion German marks, I believe that's. So their, their, their economy is just useless. Part of why that happened is because they just started printing money. So basically, printing, yeah, printing money always causes too printing too much money causes hyperinflation, right? Well, printing money causes inflation. So how do you think? So how do you think? Right, but it? printing money like it's toilet paper causes hyperinflation. So how do you think we should uh, curb 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 inflation or or hyperinflation though? First of all, I'm not qualified to answer that question, but I would say the first fundamental is just don't print money. Yeah, don't print, don't print too much. Well, like just don't print money. Okay. Like if I just wrote down on a piece of paper $100 and asked you to sell me your glasses, like just because it says $100 doesn't mean it's $100. Well, think about inflation this way, kids. Okay, if I give everybody here a gold medal, what does that gold medal mean? Nothing, everyone has one. Nothing, right? Like. Everyone has one. Well, okay, sure. In this small. Yeah. Like if I all get, if I gave you a gold medal for how well you did in this class and everybody got a gold medal, like it means nothing, right? But if the person with the highest average gets a gold medal, and there's only one gold medal given to 33 kids out of 33 kids, then that gold medal has value, right? And that's kind of what's happening here. You're printing money doesn't mean that it actually has value. It's not backed up by how much gold the country has or how much it's producing economically. So one way to deal with inflation is to continue to produce economically. Yeah, so, you know, start chopping down trees, start digging up coal, gas and oil. Basically more jobs or something? Yeah, so part partly, right? Like you're gonna have to hire people to do things. It's part of how, part of Hitler's success is that he just put people to work. I believe about a million people he put to work. Like not in the horrible, not concentration camp way. I'm talking about Germans. So. There's massive unemployment, people don't have jobs, the currency is worthless. There's no hope, there's no future. The payments still exist. No one's willing to help Germany because everyone's still pissed at them. So Germany is in a desperate situation financially. Politically, well, Germany's pretty close to Russia, so they had just witnessed the Russian Revolution at the end of World War I at the end of it. They had just seen the Germans, sorry, they had just seen the Russians execute their royal family, like in gruesome style, they shot the children as well, the royal children. And they've watched the communist revolution take the lives of 10 to 20 million people. 
So politically speaking, they're also in a very serious, complicated situation. There isn't a lot of faith in their government because a lot of the Germans didn't like or appreciate the fact that their government, the democratically chosen government, the Weimar government, accepted the Treaty of Versailles. Many Germans felt like, well, to hell with it, let's just keep fighting. But the government signed the treaty, and I think was dissolved not that long after, like the Weimar Republic falls apart. So they don't have a government they can believe in. They have a political system, a political ideology, communism, which they're terrified of, as they should be, because they're watching millions of people die. Financially speaking, they have no hope. It really leaves open the opportunity for a very charismatic, strong personality to say that, hey, I can pull you guys out of this mess. leads us to the, well, to this guy, which we'll chat about soon, but it leads to a variety of political parties being made, but particularly the National Socialist German Workers Party or Nazi Party, which is interesting. Uh, you know, the Nazis were socialists. Um, they certainly played that card to gain people's hearts. There's also an underlying fear and hatred of communism among many business owners and landowners. Naturally, right? Like, for what little they do have, people are, you know, concerned in their attempt to protect it. Okay. I'm gonna pause here for the time being. So we just went.